Okay, Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> you know, somebody is likening the epistle to the Romans to the vertebrae in the human body. It is to the New Testament what our vertebrae is in our physical system. To some it's the most profound book, others say of course it's not. It's surely a marvellous book. I think an old hymn that we used to sing when we were youngsters about the Bible, it is a golden casket where gems of truth are stored. It is the heaven-drawn picture of Christ the living word. Now the whole subject from Genesis to Revelations, or as the old man that got mixed up said, said from generations to revolutions, <clears throat> the whole subject is Jesus actually, isn't it? He is the center, the circumference, the first and the last, the beginning and the ending, the light and the life. Now go home and digest that. No, stay a bit longer, I want to talk to you. It's very obvious that as you read this chapter, it begins with what? There is therefore now no condemnation. Begins with no condemnation, it ends with no separation. But in between the no condemnation and the separation, there's an awful lot of tribulation. Now let me be honest with you here, I got interested in this chapter this week, then switched from the theme, one theme in the chapter, Uh, let me show you where the word is now. Uh, verse 26, let me say this. You know, if you read carefully through this marvellous chapter, if you've read through the seventh chapter, as I've reminded you, to me Romans 7 is a graveyard, or a funeral service, or a funeral march, and Romans 8 is a wedding march. I love this, you, you may not like it, I'm going to say it because I enjoy it. One of the greatest English writers was John Milton. You may have read one of his books, Paradise Lost, was his classic. He wrote it after he got married. <laughs> <coughs> then his second volume is even better, Paradise Regained, he wrote that after his wife died. <laughs> now Betty, don't look at me like that, you put me off. <laughs> but that's literally true, I mean I'm not joking, that's really true. Well, Paradise, I, I think if uh, Paul had known that hymn, Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus I come, he would have sung it coming out of Romans 7. The trouble with modern theology, the preachers all get stuck on wretchedness, oh wretched man that I am. Hmm? You remember there's a hymn, I, I don't know how it begins, you may know it, there's a phrase in it, prone to wonder Lord I feel it, you remember that hymn? Prone to leave the God I love. Go sing that to your wife. When you go home tonight, sing, prone to wonder, wife I feel it. Say, what? Prone to leave the wife I love. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't make any more sense to God. I don't feel like leaving God. I want to get near and near every day I live. That's my one petition. I want to get near and nearer, closer, near to the heart of God as we sing sometimes. If you read through the nine, uh, seventh chapter, you'll discover that about 31 times the apostle uses the first person there, I, 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 it's all I. Finishing almost with all wretched man that I am. Now go through some time and mark every one of the eyes, I think that's 32, mark, mark them with a little red spot. And then go through the same chapter and mark all the times he mentions the Holy Spirit. He won't have any trouble because he doesn't mention him once. Then you come into the 8th chapter. See how many times he mentions I there. What, what are the verses? Uh, I should have checked my homework, shouldn't I? Verse 18, for I reckon. Now he can't put anybody else there but himself. For I reckon. And then verse from 18 you jump to 38. For I am persuaded. Now the ninth chapter is all I, I, I. I'm in bondage. I'm not the man I want to be. I'm in captivity. No Holy Spirit. Come to the eighth chapter, 18 verses 18 and 38 with the I. 
Then you go through and read how many times, and the Holy Spirit is mentioned about 26 times. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and of death. It's a wonderful epistle. This man's an amazing writer. He tells us, uh, with all the corruption that he mentions in the first two chapters of Romans, and it's terrible, he brings us through and shows us that Jesus died to redeem us. Or if you want to put it in another word, to pardon us. But he goes from pardon to purity. He can not only pardon us, a man needs more than cleansing, uh, forgiveness, he's all his old sins washing out, he needs more than that. That's wonderful to have your record destroyed. Peter told us in England about a man that couldn't keep silent in the meeting. We had a man in our Methodist church like that. He was a nuisance. I mean, he was when I was a little boy. Boy, I'd love to have him now. He used to explode about four times every meeting. I used to think that's only once. That's two. Two to go. And boy, when he let rip, he shattered the place nearly. I mean, he'd, he'd been brought up out of a horrible pit. And therefore, salvation meant much more to him than the stuffy little girls in the choir, to, choir who used to giggle when he shouted. Well, this man had a problem in the church he was in. When they got a new uh, fine pastor from one of the theological cemetery, seminaries, somebody warned him, now, you better watch, because Sunday night this man, he goes off like a bomb, he'll, he'll, he'll disturb you. And sure enough, he did. The fellow let rip when he talked about redemption and being saved. Little old guy who had enough sense to damn a multitude of people, never mind himself, and his load had gone. When you ask people and they say, I don't know whether I'm saved or not, well, they're not saved. What's Bunyan say about the man who carried the bundle on his back and he came to a place, he said, where he was walled in on either side, I came to a place that was somewhat ascending and I saw a cross. And when I saw the cross, the burden loose from off my shoulders, fell from off my back and rolled into an empty sepulchre and I beheld it no more forever. And he gave three leaps for joy and he was a Baptist. <coughs> <laughs> So what do you think Pentecostals would do? I gave three leaves for joy, and my burden rolled away. I saw it go off my shoulders, it rolled down the hill into the empty sepulchre. You see, the, the message of Christ is based on an empty cross, on an empty sepulchre. Yeah. Now this little old guy used to shout, so when the preacher went to see him during the week, he said, now friend, uh, I, I knew you were coming, but he said a, a college friend of mine came in and he's in my, he's in the room there. Would you kindly stay in my office? And you can look at the books, so there were encyclopedias and all kinds of things. And the man sitting there talking to his college friend, and suddenly the guy explodes with a monstrous hallelujah. He says, uh, What's this all about? That's not a Bible you're reading. He said, No, sir, it's an encyclopedia. Hallelujah. What's in it? What makes you excited about it? He said, sir, it says here, there's a place where the sea is 33,000 feet deep, and the place near the Philippines where they can't even find the bottom. Hallelujah! For what? He said, because he cast my sins beyond the depth of the sea. And he said, if the devil tries to get them, we'll get drowned anyhow. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe his theology wasn't very good, but I like the idea. He's put our sins away, your sins. Maybe he didn't have many. Maybe you were college sins, or upper class sins, or maybe you were a prostitute, I don't care a hill of beans what you were. If you came to the cross and you found pardon, pardon is one thing, purging is something else. But he came not only to give us pardon, not only to give us purging, but to give us peace. Peace through the blood of, of his cross. And Paul says he is our peace. Again, I remind you that before he left the disciples, in John 14, he says, Peace I leave with you, but wait a minute, what brand? My peace. The peace that ru ran through his life when they tried to push him over the precipice. He wasn't flustered, he had the same peace that he had when he walked down the road. The same peace that when they were spitting in his face, or again yelling to him, come down from the cross. A peace dominated him, a peace that passes all understanding and all misunderstanding. My peace I live with you. He gave us his joy in, in the 16th chapter of John there. He says, joy, my joy, and no man taketh it from you. 
Now, if you lose your joy, you lose it. It's your fault. It's nobody else's. The devil has no power to take it. Circumstances haven't. You may not feel an emotional kick. That's not it. People say, I don't, I don't know where I'm really saved. I say, are you married yet? Do you feel married? Do you have to feel married? Now, some of you, I won't look at you too closely. Okay, let's look at this verse 26. This is the chapter on the Spirit. Likewise, also, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself, or himself it should be, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Go down to verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, he is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. So what do you have? You have the intercession of what? The Son of God himself? Intercession of the Holy Spirit? In verse 27. Verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. We don't know how to pray as we ought, verse 26, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us. Verse 27, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Christ also makes intercession for us. So you have the intercession of the Spirit, the intercession of Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father, and the intercession which he gives us. Now, I, I, I've come to this conclusion, you may disagree, if you do, you're wrong. <coughs> But I believe that prayer is a gateway to intercession. I believe that intercession is the gateway to travel. I believe that worship, that praise is the gateway to worship. There's no way of leaping into an experience of travel. To use a common phrase, it's an education in the spirit. We move. In our, in our steps, continually making progress, or we should, in the, in the realm of prayer. We get beyond our simple petitions, they may still be simple in one sense. But we get again from, the, from prayer to travel, upon me to intercession. If two people are talking and I go and say, hey, listen just a minute, well, obviously I'm interrupting. I project myself against two people with my conversation. If there's two people fighting and I go, and I push them apart, I'm interfering. If I stand between a holy God and a dying world with the spirit he wants, I'm an intercessor. I put myself between. I'm not asking the church to do it. You know, the revival... Adamant told me from Denver today, talking about revival. Okay. Do you know there's a revival in Denver by Wilbur Chapman, who was still around when I was a youngster. A great American evangelist, he's not mentioned much. He went to Denver. Do you know what happened? The Spirit came on that city till all the shops closed. The anniversary of that event will be the 13th of January. He asked me to fly up for the night and spend a night with him in prayer, and then have a prayer day, that, which I can't do because of something else for the Dale knows. But it's the anniversary. It's the 100th year from the time when the Spirit came and locked up that city. We don't do that anymore. We get a big shot evangelist flying in his private plane and put a lot of show on and get some broken down starlets from Hollywood and broken winded footballers. <coughs> and they put a show on. The trouble is that when they leave town, the presence of God leaves town. If he was ever there anyhow. That is not revival. Call it anything you like. Call it emotionalism. Call it evangelism. I picked up a little thing. I'd forgotten I'd ever written it. And I saw it the other day in my office there. I thought, that looks good. It said, and then I saw my name at the bottom, so I knew it was. <laughs> <coughs> he said, the reason we do not have revival is that we're content to live without it. When we're not content to live without it, we'll have revival. If we put as much zeal into business or 
Or if we go down to business with God like those guys, you know, at West Point, you know, shiny buttons, we're looking for a few good men. Well, God is, and he's looking for a few rotten men that want to become God, that want to be cleansed and anointed in the spirit. There's no academic distinction demanded. There's no social distinction. You can't be there, you're of royal birth. You can't be there because your daddy owns a... I almost said a hamburger joint, but I won't say that. Uh, you can't get there by any other way except crawling there on our hands and knees. <clears throat> Imagine God closing a city down, 1905. Nobody went to work, nobody went to business, everybody went into churches and they waited on God. The man that called me was Charles, uh, Charles Blair. He has maybe the biggest church, or one of the biggest churches there in Denver. Uh, is, is the 13th as, um, a Saturday, Sunday, do you know? 13th of January? It's either the Sunday, it is, thank you. Well, that's the day, a fo big football day. And the Denver Broncos are in the running for the, uh, what is it? Soap bubbles. <coughs> You know what he's going to do? He's going to continue the Sunday morning meeting right, right through in the afternoon in intercession. Isn't that something? Yeah. He says, we're getting real concerned about revival. I said, well, bless you. I'd love to be there. I can't make it. I'd love to be there. Again, God does not answer prayer. He answers desperate prayer. Yeah. Prayer does not change things. Prayer changes people and they change things. I've come to this conclusion, Martin, you check me about this, you, I'll ask you during the week now. We, we pray so often the word of the, is it the psalmist or Isaiah who says, arm of the Lord awake. Well, if Jesus Christ is the head, who's the, heart? Who's the arm? We must be the arm. We talk about the body. What's the body? It's not a corpse. No. The body. We must be the arm. Yeah. Arm of the Lord awake and put on strength. The Spirit maketh intercession for us with what? With groanings which cannot be uttered. I know I get into trouble about many things. It doesn't trouble me. I get into trouble but it doesn't trouble me. <laughs> groanings which cannot be uttered. Or taking the epistle of Jude. Praying in the Holy Ghost is praying in tongues. I don't believe that for a minute. Are you going to tell me that Finney never prayed in the Holy Ghost? Are you going to tell me John Wesley never prayed in the Holy Ghost? Why, John Wesley used to meet a bunch of guys. The trouble with Wesley, I have a lot of trouble with Wesley. He was more spiritual and he wasn't spiritual, and I am and he am spiritual. He used to stay up all night and pray. And they, they were just stuffy Church of England, brilliant scholars of Oxford University. He, he was a don in the university. In other words, he was a scholar, a teacher in the university. Oh, brother, would I like to have dropped in with that crowd? Who was there? John Newton, you know, that wrote that amazing... No... Yeah, Amazing Grace, he wrote, How Sweet the Sound. He also wrote, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. William Cowper was there. He, no, he wrote, when, There is a Fountain Filled with N Newton wrote, uh, Amazing Grace. Charles Wesley was there. John Wesley was there. The holiest man that lived since the days of the Apostle John Wesley said was a man by the name of John Fletcher. When somebody said, Mr. Wesley, don't grieve over his death, You'll see him there in heaven. My brother, he said. John Fletcher will be so near to the throne of God. This is Wesley. John Wesley, John, John Fletcher will be so near to the throne of God. And I'll be so far away that I'll only see the reflected glory of Jesus, the King of Kings, in the face of that man. Why does that leave me? I don't think he's right. But I like his attitude. But those are the men that birthed Methodism. They were not rich men, they were intellectually rich. I believe every man that John Wesley had, and you can get it, all the books are being rewritten now. They were, a friend of mine has republished them not too long ago. Schmuel, you know Schmuel's writings, Martin? Um, I've, I've, I've sent for a catalogue, six catalogues, so I'll give you one. Schmuel has reprinted what used to be called... Uh, what they call it? 
Wesley's, Wesley? No, yeah, in the American edition they're called Wesley's veterans. I believe every man that he had with him was equal to him spiritually, not intellectually. You don't need a whole crop of intellectual men, but spiritually they were equal with him. They knew how to travel in birth, they knew how to pray. You talk about a poverty stricken crowd. Nobody that lives in monasteries ever lived as, as, as carefully as those guys. Monasteries became rotten with riches, the very thing they tried to run away from. Everybody left their money to monasteries thinking they were giving it to the kingdom of God. So the monasteries became vastly wealthy and had pure gold candlesticks inside and all the rest of the junk. But these men lived only, Wesley says, let me live to preach thy word. I give you a phrase of Charles Wesley, he says, this is, this is colossal I think, enlarge, inflame and fill my heart with boundless charity divine. So shall I all my strength exert and love them with a zeal like thine and turn them to a pardoning God and quench their brands, brands in Jesus' blood. Give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. Give me, that, give me that childlike praying love which longs to build thy house again. Thy love let it my heart or power and all my simple soul devour. Wesley picked up a piece of paper one day, on it, a ragged piece of paper. A hundred years before he was born, a beautiful little French, petite French lady, Marie Antoinette Bourignot. What is, what's her hymn start with? Come Saviour Jesus from above, assist me with thy heavenly grace. Empty my heart of earthly love and thought, that's where it starts. The Lord won't love totally in your life if you love your wealth, if you love your position, if you love something else, he won't take second place. Right. Come Saviour Jesus from above, assist me with thy heavenly grace. Empty my heart of earthly love and for thyself prepare a place. Nothing too dramatic. Now what about this? Nothing on earth do I desire but thy pure love within my breast. This only this will I require and freely give up all the rest, wealth, honor, pleasure, and what else a short enduring world can give. Tempt as ye will, my soul rebels, for Christ alone resolved to live. Thee will I love and thee alone with pure delight and inward bliss. To know thou takes me for thine own. Oh, what a happiness is this. Well, he lived like that. It wasn't that he got bowled over when he found that piece of paper with that written on. It became the... I was going to use a big word, it doesn't matter there. They used to have a standard bearer, you know. The old families in England have a flag and it became the thing that he put on his flag, so to speak. Nothing on earth do I desire but thy pure love within my breast. Do you think he didn't get tempted a thousand times about that? His family was next to the royal family in England. He lived in a home with servants. He rode through the night. 240,000 miles he travelled on horseback, never once molested by the highwaymen. Got to the place where he could only f feed like the squirrels, he ate acorns or he ate blackberries off the, off the, off the side of the road. And yet it never troubled him. Why? Because he's consumed with a holy passion. Yeah. I love that, but I've never preached on it, where Jesus says, The prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. I want to be there. Oh, do you want to be there, Dale? The prince of this world comes, and there's no territory in me that responds to him. So he, he, he's in despair. He finds God has worked such a miracle of grace, he's not only got rid of all my lousy sins, he's got a, a, my sin principle out of me, and he's come and so possess me that the devil can't find any area in me. The prince of this world cometh, and he findeth nothing in me. Well, how could he if Wesley says that, that this love consumes him? He'll give up the world, love of the world, prestige, everything that... You know, sometimes I guess I'm funny. Well, Sharon knows that, but she wouldn't tell you that. You know, I sometimes wish I could slip to heaven just for a rehearsal of the Judgment Day. It would be amazing, wouldn't it? Of course, you can read it in the book of Revelation. 
But when God unfolds all the things that these men sneered at kind of thing, wealth, honour, pleasure, and what else this short, enduring world can give. Do you wonder that one of the greatest American preachers ever, Jonathan Edwards, said, God stamp eternity on my eyeballs. Yeah. That's pretty tough, isn't it? I say often for myself and others, Lord, we're so earthbound. Don't you think that, Jim? We're earthbound. With our petty little circle, our family. Oh no, a bit bigger than that, the church. No, a bit little, big, bigger than that, Garden Valley. Heaven help us. Which is all right. But when eternity comes in, the whole life is completely revolutionized. Every distortion, everything's brought into focus. Nothing on earth do I desire. It's a mess, it's a dunghill. All I want is thy pure love within my breast. That love so amazing, so divine, that ever into love crooked, perverted, rotten, corrupt people. And then uh, Paul says what to the Corinthians, and such are some of ye, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified. Oh, you know, this. I've, I've lost my watch, I've got an old one here, but it's a good one. Because it keeps stopping. <laughs> so if you're here an extra hour, you'll know why. It's because my watch keeps stopping. Not my fault. <clears throat> they blame somebody. This is the thing that really got me. Let me see. Let me find the verse. It's here in this chapter. In Romans 8 again. I would dare to say to you tonight that not one percent of the preachers in America will use this text and it's the greatest text for Christmas. Verse 32 of Romans 8 He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God help us, we've stopped at John 3.16 You go to the average church every Sunday morning it's the same thing, the preacher runs the same sermon or as somebody said he runs the same train he just changes the engine it has a red engine one week and a blue one the next and a green one the next God has with him what did I say? He has freely given us all things My something here. He that spared not his own son. An old English hymn says, Thou didst not spare thine only son, but gavest him for a world undone. And freely with that blessed one thou gavest all. Delivered him up for us all. Think of the scope of it. And take the whole race, all the human race, put them all in one great circle here. Whether they're red or yellow, black or white, barbarians, Scythians, bond or free. Paul sums the whole thing up and he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, which is race distinction, bond nor free, class distinction, male nor female, nor, nor female sex distinction. You can't get outside of that circle, can you? He delivered him up for us all. Well, why don't they all know? Why are people in Haiti still living under terrible superstition and witchcraft? Why again are the people up the Amazon? I think of that place so often. The first book Norman Grobe wrote was about a young man called Fenton Hall. He was the Babe Ruth of English cricket. An aristocrat, six feet four in his stocking feet, champion tennis player in the Royal Air Force, champion cricketer. He went up the Amazon, was there three weeks and died. And people in England say, what a waste. Why didn't he stay? He could have been a clergyman, he could have been Archbishop of Canterbury. Maybe he did more than 50 archbishops did, by going up there and dying and preparing the way for others to go. Right. He was amazed when he got there to see those tribes that have been there ever since, as far as we know, almost the dawn of creation. 
had one word, that, that, that some words you couldn't explain the cross to them, didn't you know what a cross was? Can't talk about atonement and those other marvelous words, re regeneration. Brother, you start with ABCs. And yet we, these smart boys go to college now and then try and tell you how much of the Bible they don't believe. You know, when I was a boy, they, call, they used to call that higher criticism. Started in Germany. Do you know, do you know who paved the way for Hitler? The church. If higher criticism hadn't come in and doubt cast on the virgin birth and the physical resurrection of Jesus, Hitler would never have got his way. See, that's why the devil wants to get the Bible out of schools in America and prayer. My priority is not to get the Bible in schools, I to get it, get it in homes. Prayer in schools, what about prayer in homes? Yeah. I put the deacons on the spot in one church. You know, one of those nights I felt real rude and mad. <laughs> so I brought all the de all you deacons, I said, never have a family altar. Come on, you, you may as well live in Russia. Boy, did they shed some tears. Hmm. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That's the first great scope, that great circle there. And the second great circle is this, that he has with him freely given us all things. Do you think God has any afterthoughts? Let me reverently say, does he scratch his head and say, Oh, I was going to tell the Apostle Paul that oh, I should have told John on the Isle of Patmos. Does God have afterthoughts? No. He spared not his own son, but freely given us all things. Look at the who's here. In verse 33, who shall lay anything? Verse 34, who is he that condemneth? Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know, Paul's always talking about things in this chapter. You know, you, most of you can recite Romans 8.28, can't you? Romans 8.28. <clears throat> What is it? All what? Things. Things. Well now he uses the word here again. He has freely given us all things. Now leap up to the 37th verse. Nay, in all these things. What thing? All things proceed from Jesus Christ. We've been thinking of that in Hebrews chapter 1, haven't we? God says of him, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. He upholdeth all things by the word of his power. You see, everything in the, in the whole world and in creation is moving up to Jesus Christ right now. It's all come from him. It, it is in him. It's going to be for him. But this is so enormous. In all these things, what things? Well, you get some questions in some little books, don't you? Fill in the uh, put words, the missing words. What's he talking about? Well, what has he been talking about? Who, who, who? Who is he that condemns? Does does somebody dare to challenge the finished work of Jesus Christ in my life? Who is he that condemneth? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now these are the things in this very verse. 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, peril, nakedness, or sword. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. Come on, come on. Seems to me here that the, the, the Apostle Paul put his shoulders back and, if you like it, thumbed his nose to the devil. I said, listen, I challenge everything you have there in hell. You can heat your furnaces seven times hotter and make all the weapons of persecution you like. But there's nothing can separate me from the love of God. I'm the only one that can do that by my unfaithfulness, by my disobedience. Nobody else can do it. They may cross you off the membership roll. One of our boys used to say, well, it's, it's about as good as having it on a sausage roll if you're not saved. So what if you get thrown out of court? What happens? What matters? 
You know, the apostle here says all things. Just as he says all things, not some, all things work together for good. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors. But this last verse, it seems to me, is pushing into our day. There's neither height nor depth nor any other creature. You see, since Paul wrote this, if you can think of it this way, which isn't, which, which isn't good, the horizon of the, of the universe was there in the days of Paul. Now it's somewhere up there. We're pushing the, the, the horizon back. We've got a thing called the sun here. We've got a thing called the world here. I understand that you could put 500 worlds in that one sun, 500 of our one worlds in that sun. You could put a thousand of those worlds in a sun that's up there in space that they find a while ago, up away there in infinity. Supposing there are demon powers. And there are demon powers, sure enough. But supposing there are some green men living in another world. He says, neither things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor wholly defines it, neither height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Tell me when I go out that while we were here, a flying saucer landed down there. There's some mysterious little men running around. We don't know what kind of power guns they may shoot your ears off or something. <laughs> nor any other creature, he said. God hasn't missed anything. The redemptive work of Jesus Christ is not an unfinished work. It's a perfect work. God hasn't omitted anything. He has freely given us all things. What all things? Well, let me read it without you looking at it. I'll tell you what it is. It's according to his divine power. He hath given us unto us all things. I didn't put that there. Peter didn't put it there. The Holy Ghost put it there because it complements what John, Paul had said. In, in the second epistle of Peter, chapter 1 and verse 3, according to his divine power, he hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. People get, a, oh, God's given us all things. I'm going to believe God for Christmas, a nice Christmas gift, a, a Rolls Royce. Oh, not a, surely not a black one, a blue one. Oh, he's going to give me this. We're always on the level of thinking like poor, so-called rational people outside. I don't wonder the good old book says the world loves its own. It does. You can climb the social ladder, you can climb the religious ladder, you can climb the church ladder. God has anticipated every motion that I need to make in my life. Every motion, every emotion. Every subtlety of the devil, every cunning trap of the devil. He can make us alive in the Holy Ghost to this degree, as I've said before, if we prayed longer in the morning, we wouldn't be praying at night to get over our troubles. It's our fault we didn't get alerted. We weren't wise in the spirit. Was uh, Oh, well, I, I've got to be at Dillard's at a certain time. I'm always saying Dillard's. I should get a commission on that. <laughs> Dillard's first, and then, of course, we're going over to Sanger Harris, where all the big f shots shop. And then we're going to my shop, where the poorer guys go, J.C. Penney's. <laughs> We've got it all planned out. Well, what if you say before you go, Lord... Uh, Maybe the best thing for me this morning is to have a flat tire when I get right down on three to... Oh, no, don't ask God for things like that. We don't glory in, in tribulation. We glory in uh, police cars come and help us out or tow away wagons or something. What if God stops me on the road because some poor old sinner is going to come up and he needs me to talk to him and there's no one else who will talk to him all day? Those wonderful Quakers... Remember they did, in your day, did they talk about having an authentic stop in the spirit? You're going to do something and suddenly, like that, God says no. And you can't explain it. Just God said no. An authentic stop in the spirit. A plan that you thought was perfect, maybe for a week or a month or so, and suddenly collapses the whole thing. Why? Because he's going to get more glory out of the ruins and you get out of the whole thing, that's why. But Brother Raymond, it's a scientific day. You're right, it is. It is. 
Are you suggesting uh, that God has an invading... Yes, I'm suggesting you've forgotten about it. I'm going to tell you what it's done. What did Jesus say? He could call down twelve legions of angels? Wasn't that what he said? And the smallest denominator of a legion is five thousand. Five thousand is a legion. Twelve fives are sixty. So that's sixty thousand, isn't it? Do I get my numbers right? Sixty thousand what? Oh, I read this today. I get such fun and joy out of it. It came to pass that night an angel of the Lord went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 people. One angel killed 185,000. I'm leaving this to uh, for Dale to be working out while I do this. What's 6,000 times 185,000? Work it on your computer. I think it comes to about a hundred and ten or a thousand million, which is more than a billion. So if the Lord sent an invading army, if we were in that danger and we had faith, you know, we sing, Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Huh? Sufficient is thine arm alone, but give us a bigger air force. <laughs> Sufficient is thine arm alone, but give us submarines that have uh, more power than the Russians. Who do we fool? You think God doesn't do miracles? How do you explain the six days war that the, 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 the Jews had? They were outnumbered in every way. They were going to be completely wiped out. And those little guys got in the sky and smoked Pharaoh and his host, modern Pharaoh. Children of Israel going through the Red Sea, not a dog's chance. Look over the shoulder, oh look who's coming. See the dust, oh Pharaoh's coming, all his armies and whatnot. And them got a chariot between them. That was the greatest baptism service in history. <laughs> they all got baptized at the same time. Well, th th this is reality. I'm not, I'm not fooling. When, when the Lord showed me that, that the smallest denominator, some say it's 10,000 make a legion of angels. If one angel can destroy 185,000 people, and you multiply that by 10,000 times, it, it could wipe the population of the earth out in one night. And it wouldn't strain his arm to do it. He could wipe all existing communities, all existing systems out. Yeah. After all, he's going to hand everything over to the Son. Freely, he has given with, with him, he's freely given us all things. He's not only given us, as I say, pardon and peace, pardon and purity and peace what about joy love and joy in the Holy Ghost yes. not many people have joy as I've said before the, the more joy you have the less entertainment you need joy to the world the Lord is come the world doesn't know a thing about Jesus all it knows about the manger I'm afraid I'm afraid and I'm not embarrassed to say it. I'd like to preach in 10,000 preachers you boys are all stuck again at the crib at the crib We're supposed to have gotten out of Egypt, a type of the world, and away from Pharaoh, the devil, a type of the devil. But where are we? We're stuck somewhere between the resurrection morning and the upper room. We're still stuck there. My prayer is that we'll do what old Lowry said years ago and old Nazarene. We'll explore in this coming year the possibilities of grace. The only reason the world is morally bankrupt tonight is because the church is spiritually bankrupt. Right. We're not going to find a new little few petty answers. The rate we're going, the, the world can last another million years, we won't evangelize it. There has to be an invasion of God's power. He came the first time, what did he do? He split the whole BC, before Christ, AD, Anno Domini. Every letter, every letter written today, and, and what is it now in America, uh, 50 million or 100 million letters are written every day. And every one of them is testifying to the birth of Christ. Even the atheist, when he signs a letter, puts a date in every business contract you do. You put the birth of Jesus there. Well, how are we going to get away with it at the judgment seat? He didn't save us just to be pretty angels when we get up there. 
What did our hymn say tonight? Charles Wesley's Adam's likeness now he face stamp thine image in its place. I said to Brother Dale today we're better off than the disciples that were with Jesus. They only had Jesus with them. We can have Jesus in us. Yeah. Christ in you. He can be born again in us. We receive a new nature. With new desires, new interests. It's, if, that's it, if, it's, if it's according to the legal document of God's will, all things are passed away. You get, you've got preachers that admit they stick their feet up Saturday, Sunday afternoon and relax and drink. Admit they stick their feet up Saturday, Sunday afternoon and relax and drink cokes and eat fritos and go all soggy to preach at night. They've lost sight of eternity. We're not an eternity conscious people. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown. Why did he come to a hell of a world like this to be buffeted and bruised and an outcast? The first thing he did before he could walk or talk was divide a, de, 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 divide a city. All Herod, was, all Herod was troubled, all Jerusalem with him. And a few old stupid people down here, an old woman a hundred years of age, and Simeon who's tottering on his legs, and a young woman who's pregnant and uh, reckons it was a miracle. And she has a cousin that's pregnant and she's all totally excited. Maybe there weren't twenty people in Jerusalem at that time that believed that Jesus was the Son of God. I quote this as I quoted before. But the Quaker philosopher, Elton Trueblood, was asked, what do you see for the church at the end of the 20th century? He said that by the end of the century, the church of Jesus Christ will be a conscious minority surrounded by an arrogant militant paganism. The church has always been there. It's there today, never mind the end of the 20th century. It was, it was born amidst paganism. It was born in the most cruel system in the world. The Romans had given a bloodbath to Israel and give another bloodbath on, in AD 70. The church has always been a conscious minority. We shouldn't be too conscious of minority. We should be conscious of the fact that we're linked to omnipotence. He's given us all things. I don't care a hang what this generation needs. Jesus Christ had thought ahead of us. Right. When he wants us to come, when he wants you to come, he'll bring supermen back. I don't believe God went out of business when he created Finney and Wesley and all the superstars of history. Forget it. We need bigger men than that. Not bigger, with bigger heads, bigger spiritually. Yeah. With new revelation, with new depth, with new anointing. With new faith. That dare to disregard all the wretched, rotten systems that we have today that profess the name of Jesus Christ. Multi-million dollar gospel corporations. I can't believe it. Sour grapes, you see. I don't even have an office staff except my wife, and she has to quit sometimes, and I. I'm not a bit envious of anybody. Not a man in the world could make me envious. Well, some stupid old man up in Oregon has 46 Rolls Royces. That's what you get when people love you. Everybody says they love me, I can't even get one Rolls Royce. <laughs> Oh, I want you to bathe your soul from here out. That whatever you're going to need, wherever you're going, I don't care if God does shut you up in the Amazon there. Maybe God's going to go to some heathen country and show us what true revival's around. We've so much false religion here, so many plastic Christians, so many puppets in the, in the pulpit instead of prophets. He's going to have to cleanse his temple again. Is God embarrassed that I don't draw on him more day by day? Answer it for yourself. Am I standing at the street corner like the poor old Salvation Army standing there rattling the tin cans? William Booth set the world on fire. He entered 90 countries, 70 countries in 90 years. He was lampooned on the English stage, but the day came when Queen Victoria invited him to Buckingham Palace to have afternoon tea. Not that that means too much. Shows you the full circle. I'm still believing God's going to do something beyond all we can ask or think. Amen. He's going to do a new thing. I believe it's hidden in this word. We've got to discover it. 
If it's outside of this word, you can't trust it. If it's inside of this word, we need to find it. I'm trusting this coming year, and I don't care if the congregation dwindles. I hope it doesn't, but if it does, I'll do like Jesus, stand there one night and say, Will ye also go away? I'm asking God to put me on a new elevation. Not for my sake, for his sake. I don't want to be anybody. I, want to see his, I don't want to see his name blasphemed and misrepresented anymore. Yeah. Don't want to have people shouting big things about little things. Yeah. I want you to come and do something which only the sovereign hand of God can do. If there was that invasion of, a, what, 5,000 times 185,000, tonight the world would know, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Why can't it happen on the spiritual level? He has given Jesus Christ for you, and with him he's freely given him all things you'll ever need. Power, peace, faith. It's all wrapped up in his gift. When he gave him, he gave the utmost. There's nothing else in heaven to give. Gabriel doesn't supersede Jesus, or Michael, or anyone else. Everything was wrapped up in that babe there. That's why, before he could walk at all, the devil tried to kill him. And all through his life he was shadowed with death all the way. Well, you can stay where you like. I, I hope you won't. I hope you'll reach out as I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going to say, Lord, uncover from your word what things I need to possess. I know I need it a lot. He has freely given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's not overlooked a thing in your life or mine. It's, we are not alerted to it through the word of God.